All right, great. So uh, I'm just going to do a quick introduction and then we'll get into it. So welcome to, uh, I don't remember which number of event this is, <laughs> but uh, welcome to this event in the In Conversation series in the Burbeck College Student Union. Uh, I'm Naomi Smith, one of the student leaders, uh, and I just wanted to kick us off with a few words before I hand over to Megan. Um, so uh, this is a slightly different uh, event in that normally we would have sort of a conversation thing, um, but Megan is going to be delivering a lecture and then uh, that'll be followed by an opportunity to ask questions. Um, so Megan works in uh, as a lecturer in the criminology department and she is conducting research using computer mapping software to counter map the Metropolitan Police's use of suspicionless stop and search powers contained in Section 60 of the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act 1994. Um, she uses uh, geographic information system software to map when, where and why the Met Police are using their Section 60 powers. Um, and she's going to go more into like preliminary findings and, and all of those things. Uh, so thank you so much for coming to speak with us, uh, Megan, and over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation to speak with you today uh, and particularly uh, for bearing with me, Naomi, when we're trying to find a mutually convenient date. Uh, so yes, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, as Naomi said, I primarily research racialized policing and today I'm going to speak about one of my works in progress, which is a project looking at the Metropolitan Police's use of powers contained in Section 60 of the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act of 94. Uh, I don't want to assume any prior knowledge, so I'm going to begin by explaining what those powers are, so what powers are contained in Section 60 of the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act. And then once that foundation's in place, I'll move on to explain the methodological approach that I'm developing to study the racial and spatial patterning of the Met Police's use of Section 60 powers. So to put that a bit more plainly, I'm going to explain how I'm using mapping software to illustrate when and where the police have used those powers across London, who's affected by their use, and then I'll also explain why I think it's worthwhile to undertake that mapping work. I'll wrap up by discussing what we might call directions for further research that have occurred to me or that have been suggested to me while I've been working on the project. So basically I'll conclude by giving a sense of how the project has become more complicated while I've been working on it and how I think I might take it forward. And I guess it's probably worth me stressing again that this is very much a work in progress. Um, so I intend to speak for 15, possibly 20 minutes at worst. Uh, which should leave plenty of time before the end of the session. So if you have any comments or questions, please do let me know and I'd absolutely love to hear them and to discuss them with you. Okay, so I'll start in earnest now and I'll explain what I mean when I say Section 60 powers. So for the fifth time, the phrase Section 60 is a shorthand reference to Section 60 of the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act of 1994. And under Section 60, officers ranked inspector or above, so they're relatively junior officers, can make what we call a Section 60 order, which has the effect of designating a geographic area in which police can stop and search any pedestrian or vehicle. And to be clear, police don't need to form legally articulable suspicion that the pedestrian or the vehicle uh, or the persons in the vehicle are or have been engaged in wrongdoing to be able to stop them. They can just be stopped and searched simply owing to the fact that they're present in an area where a Section 60 order has been made. And that's why we call Section 60 powers and a few others like them suspicionless search powers, because police don't need to legally establish their suspicion that a person has been engaged in wrongdoing to search them, as they do with other types of stop and search. So according to the Act, police should only make an order under Section 60 if they reasonably believe that an incident involving serious violence may take place in their locality, if an incident of serious violence has taken place in the area and the designation is necessary so that police can recover the instrument that was used in the incident, or if they reasonably believe that people are carrying dangerous instruments or offensive weapons in the area. 
But to the best of my knowledge, there's no systematic public information about how police interpret the meaning of terms in the act like serious violence or dangerous instruments. And it's probably also worth me noting that Section 60 orders usually last for 24 hours, but they can be extended. Um, so Section 60 powers aren't new, and they've actually been in place since 1994, having been introduced as a, a tool, I suppose, uh, that the police could use against football hooliganism. But the police's use of Section 60 powers increased dramatically at the end of 2019 because the government effectively repealed their formal guidance about when police could exercise suspicionless search powers. And the stated rationale for the government doing that was to encourage police to conduct more searches as part of their attempts to uh, crack down on so-called knife crime. So it's probably unsurprising then that the police's use of Section 60 powers increased in excess of 400% from the 2017-18 to the 2018-19 financial year. And it may interest those of you tuning in from London, if there is anyone tuning in from London, to know that the Metropolitan Police conducted nearly three quarters of all Section 60 stops and searches in that period. But while police and politicians as well have maintained that Section 60 powers are necessary to combat knife crime, police uncovered an offensive weapon in just 2% of all Section 60 stops and searches that they conducted in the 2018 to 19 financial year. Now that low find rate, I should say, is not entirely surprising because it's pretty well established in the policing literature and in the communities that bear the brunt of police attention that police often use search powers for objectives other than detecting crime. So for example, they might use search powers to be able to stop somebody so that they can carry out surveillance, gather intelligence, or simply impose their authority. But it's also worth saying, and in fact crucial to say, that not all members of the public are equally likely to be stopped and searched. And on the contrary, the disproportionate use of stop and search powers remains an issue of huge public concern in English speaking jurisdictions. Regarding Section 60 powers specifically, uh, in 2019, an equality impact assessment published by the government itself following the repeal of the guidance on suspicionless search powers noted that Section 60 powers were disproportionately used against racialized communities and especially black people and communities. Uh, and the data that I obtained from the Met Police for this project, which I'll speak a little bit more about in just a second, but the data that I obtained for this project from the Met Police indicates that disproportionality in Section 60 stop and search is glaring. And what I mean by that is that 52% of all people stopped and searched using Section 60 powers between the 1st of August 2019 and the 31st July 2020, so that's my 12-month study period, were observed by officers as being black. So to repeat, that's 52% of people in the 12 month period. Now, given that Section 60 powers are ostensibly intended to help police respond to serious violence, that disproportionality likely reflects and reconstitutes the racialization of knife crime, violent crime and gang related crime in London. And so to put that a little bit differently, the figures that I've just read to you suggest that the police's use of Section 60 powers in London is resulting in black people and communities being policed as what we might call the usual suspects in relation to knife crime, violent crime and gang related crime, just as they have been through the use of other police tools like the gangs matrix, for example. But while there's lots of fantastic research and campaign work around the matrix and around joint enterprise and around other types of stop and search, there is a lot less work being done on Section 60s, or at least that's presently the case. But they did catch the uh, news earlier this month in May 2022. So uh, it might be the case that they are um, sort of under-researched uh, for much longer, but we'll see. Uh, in any case, I started researching Section 60 powers in 2020 uh, because I thought they probably had been a little bit overlooked, uh, but I was alarmed at the fact that they provided police with such a hugely permissive uh, tool that they could use to intervene in people's lives. And I anticipated that those tools would be used uh, primarily against black people and communities and against members of other racialized communities as well. 
So, as I said, this research is very much a work in progress, uh, having been quite seriously interrupted by COVID, um, but I'm going to talk you through what I've done to date and the state of my current thinking. So, it's my view that if we are to properly account for the racial disproportionality in the police's use of Section 60 powers, then it's crucial that we don't lose sight of the fact that Section 60 powers are unique in how they authorise police to seize control of public spaces. As I said earlier, Section 60s are inherently spatial. Sometimes an entire borough is blanketed with a Section 60 order. Uh, in other cases, the order will apply to one or two postcodes or perhaps just a few streets. So when the government first conceded in 2019 that Section 60 powers were likely to disproportionately affect black communities, but nevertheless sought to encourage police to use those powers with greater frequency, I wondered whether that disproportionality was arising because police were more likely to stop and search black people in any given area where a Section 60 order was made, or because Section 60 orders were being made more frequently in places where black communities and other racialized groups tend to reside. And of course, it could be both. So to try to figure out what was going on, I decided to map each and every Section 60 order made by the police in London between the 1st of August 2019 and the 31st July 2020. Uh, so that is the 12 month period after the government repealed that guidance about suspicionless search powers and prompted a huge uptake in their use by police. And I think it's also worth saying that my decision to map Section 60 orders was intended to uh, sort of turn police practice on its head. And what I mean by that is that in recent decades, and certainly since the turn of the 21st century, police in English speaking jurisdictions have increasingly uh, tried to target what they will call a risky place uh, to anticipate and intervene against not just crime, but also what they consider to be antisocial behaviour as well. And technologically, the imperative to police risky places has shared a close relationship with the development of computerised crime mapping technologies, which the police have used to map the distribution of crimes that they detect and record so that they can identify so-called hotspots and in turn decide where to deploy police officers in the future, which makes logical sense, right? Um, but the catch, of course, is that police will only detect crime where they deploy resources. And what that means is that when they map their own historical crime data, the maps that they produce provide a far more reliable rendering or picture of police activity than of the areas where crime is most likely to occur. And as police have historically been mandated to control and discipline uh, racialized groups and the working classes, the police's use of mapping technologies often re-entrenches the targeted policing of the usual suspects and the areas where they tend to reside. So proceeding from that observation, I've set out in this project to see not just where and when police are using Section 60 powers, but more broadly to test whether mapping technologies can be used to illustrate the intricate relationship between police resource allocation and our understandings of who commits crime and when and where they do so. Um, so yes, I've mapped every order that the police have made in London between the 1st of August 2019 and the 31st July 2020. And to find out where those orders have been made, I submitted two freedom of information requests to the Metropolitan Police, each covering a six month period. Um, and if you're wondering what a freedom of information request is, uh, to put it simply, freedom of information laws allow citizens to request and hopefully access uh, recorded information held by public authorities. So the freedom of information request that I lodged with the Met Police for this project show that more than 500 Section 60 orders were made in London during that 12 month party, uh, study period, pardon me. Um, now, I haven't published my analyses or findings yet, uh, and in fact, I'm <laughs> still busy creating more detailed maps. Um, but what I can show you today is a high level sample map, <laughs> is what I'm calling it, which will give you a sense of what I've been working on. Um, so I wonder if I can share my screen, hopefully. Yeah, I should be able to do that. Okay. 
comparing my slides. Um, are you able to see that? OK, cool. Um, so hopefully it's not too difficult to see. Um, but essentially, as I said, um, what this map does, the reason I'm calling it a high level map is because the data that the police have provided me gives you know very specific addresses. So as I said, in some cases, Section 60s will blanket an entire borough. So that's kind of a, a relatively defined area. It may be though that a Section 60 area uh, order was made you know, in a boundary contained by four streets, for example, in which case it obviously is contained within part of a borough. So that work is a lot more intricate and takes a very long time. So what this does, uh, in terms of being a high level map is that I've just mapped this by borough. So if something happened within a you know, four street um, area in Bloomsbury, I've just put it in as Camden for the minute to give, as I said, um, an overview of where section 60s have been made. Uh, and in the meanwhile, now I'm going through and doing that more intricate mapping work, um, particularly now that I've done my marking for the term. So, um, what you can see, though, I think, is that there is very serious repetition in certain parts of London. Um, you know, the uh, Hackney and Tower Hamlets, particularly, Croydon, um, Lambeth. And when I've gone in and looked at Lambeth in more detail, it does correspond uh, primarily with Brixton, um, Tottenham, for example, right, uh, Brent. And so, um, you know, and what you might be able to see as well from this map is that there is quite a lot happening in central London. Um, and maybe that's unsurprising because there are lots of people in central London. Um, but for the most part, those dates coincide with protests um, arising out of the Black Lives Matter movement. So that should give you some sense, kind of, I might just um, stop sharing that give you some sense of the work um, that I've been doing. And, you know, I think it's important for me to say that when the inherently spatial nature of Section 60 powers is considered alongside the fact that police rarely uncover a weapon during Section, uh, during section 60 stops and searches, and that according to the FOI data that the Met Police provided me, every second person stopped and searched is observed by officers as being black, it does appear that police may be using their Section 60 powers to swamp parts of London with sizable black communities. Um, and it's well established that many years of policing and also political rhetoric have turned some of the places that I've just shown you on that map and their very names, like Tottenham, for example, into bywords for crime, disorder, opposition to the police, and cultural difference. And so what I would suggest to you is that the police aren't deploying Section 60s in those areas simply to find knives, and their low weapons find rate gives us an indication of that. And instead, it would seem that they're deploying Section 60s in the areas um, that I've just displayed on that map, and often publicising the fact that they're doing so in a bid to reassert their authority, to maintain order, and to assert what I would call quite tight control over images of crime in London, particularly knife crime. Um, so I'm very nearly done here, which is probably um, you know, probably all breathing a sigh of relief. Um, but what I do want to do is wrap up by acknowledging three ways that my thinking has progressed since I started working on this project um, and suggest how I might take it forward. Uh, so first and foremost, I think there's a lot of potential for counter mapping Section 60s and other types of police practices um, in terms of providing alternative narratives about policing because they highlight the relationship between crime and crime control, particularly in terms of police resource allocation. But it does remain the case that simply mapping police powers like Section 60s um, does kind of render very coercive police practices and interventions against members of the public as though they're two dimensional. Um, so once I have a clearer idea of where section 60s tend to be authorised, I'd like to engage in a follow up project speaking with people who have been policed, with their lawyers, uh, with campaign groups and with police monitoring groups to get a better sense of how it is that Section 60 stop and search powers are affecting people. So, for example, um, how they're being used to control people's movements. Um, how they're being used to make and mark space, and whether and how people are resisting the police's use of Section 60 powers. 
Secondly, um, there is a group, we might call them an assemblage, I guess, of powers and legal resources, including Section 60 powers, that the police in London are currently being institutionally mandated, uh, that is encouraged um, by a senior police leadership and by the government to use as ordinance in the so-called fight against knife crime. And I believe that these powers, when taken together or considered alongside one another, provide um, a, a really interesting case study of the ambiguous relationship between police practice and the law. Um, so to put that a bit differently, the introduction of a new police power or of an offence that enables police to intervene um, against people who transgress it will undoubtedly uh, increase the number of legal resources or tools available to police on the books. But there are a lot of reasons why police won't use new powers once they're on the books or in the tool belt per se. Um, so for example, we've seen in respect of new knife crime prevention orders that are currently being piloted in London, the police may not use new powers when they're granted them, at least not at first, particularly if they think that they are, li are likely to be constrained by magistrates. Meanwhile, other powers like Section 60s are taken up with gusto in response to changes in legal rules. So um, yes, what I would like to do is think more about what the knife crime powers that the police have, and these are powers of varying descriptions, tell us about the relationship between police practice and the law. And finally, I am very grateful to the handful of colleagues in the criminology department who have suggested to me that there may well be a relationship between the use of Section 60 powers in London and gentrification. And I think that's definitely a line of inquiry worth pursuing as well. Uh, so I might wrap up there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and again for the invitation. Um, so yes, if you have any questions or comments, please do let me know, but uh, thanks. Thanks so much, Megan. That was really interesting. I apologise for switching my camera on and off. It, my internet is not cooperating with me <laughs> all of a sudden. Um, thank you so much. Um, I definitely have a couple of a couple of questions I can ask, but I'm going to throw it open to uh, the other the guests. Um, if any of you have any questions, if you want to put your hands up or uh, post in the chat, uh, do you feel free? Uh, yeah, Isabel, go for it. I would like to say thank you. That was so strong. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to need a few minutes to process, but that was that was really illuminating and really I quite enjoyed how I suppose how price, precise and detailed it is. Like just this small order is doing so much and it sure you really illustrated how it how it really is doing what people experience if that makes sense and what that how it actually happened the mechanism of how it happens even just with that small one so thank you I just really enjoyed that I'm just going to sit with it for a minute and as Naomi has already her questions I'll let her go with her questions and then I might follow up afterwards but thank you Megan really nice yeah no thanks Isabel thank you for that hopefully my my internet is gonna <laughs> to hold up um so I thought, yeah, I agree with everything uh, that is well said. Um, I thought it was very interesting the sort of uh, using the visual, um, uh, you know, representation, um, and obviously that's a really useful um, sort of outcome of using mapping technologies is that you're able to to create those uh those visual representations um and it was very i mean i live in croydon um grew up here so it was, <laughs> uh, and it was quite quite impactful to actually see that um uh see it represented that way and i was wondering from the perspective of sort of you know, being from Croydon and hearing the political rhetoric that she used. Um, and that what you, when you were talking about uh, it sort of being used by politicians, um, it reminded me of recently in the local elections, uh, we recently elected for the first time a directly elected mayor. And one of the things that he used was that rhetoric around, uh, he's, he's a uh, conservative, um, 
that rhetoric around knife crime and uh, and stuff. And I suppose my question that I am getting to <laughs> is um, uh, about sort of the potential, I guess, if you see potential in using, because it's so impactful, using those images that you're producing um, to, you know, for sort of political uh, impact as well as sort of talking to, you know, on the about the law legal side, uh, but also about the political side and uh, yeah, just generally what your sort of thoughts about how that kind of imagery and you know, sort of rhetoric, I suppose, to counter those narratives. Yeah, I guess that's the main motivation for the project. So as I said, I do have some concerns about the mapping in the sense that um, it flattens real life, if that makes sense. It has the potential to flatten what are highly intrusive interactions into people's lives. Um, but um, I think there is um, significant potential to, um, I, I get it pivots on a, a bit of a, a kernel of um, quite simple common sense, uh, which is that, you know, police will record crime, or police will detect crime uh, where they deploy their resources. So I think it is commonly assumed that um, things like, you know, crime statistics are objective measures of crime. Um, but we know for a fact, actually, that what they are is um, subjective indicators of police presence and police activity. Right. Um, and so what this attempts to do is actually bring that to life for people in the sense that it, it, it's easier to grapple with that when you see it depicted, um, I suppose. So that is very much the thinking is that, um, you know, picture speaks a thousand words. Um, what I would hope, though, is that um, in using this picture to, to figure out precisely which areas of London um, are most likely to be affected by the use of Section 60 powers, thousands more words might be generated, um, you know, if we are to speak with those people who are most affected um, to sort of add dimension to what would otherwise be quite a flat um, picture of police police intervention in people's communities. Um, but I think, yeah, it turns, it, it, it turns police mapping practice on its head um, by explicitly acknowledging that um, crime mapping is an indication of police practice and police presence more than an objective depiction of crime rates across um, time and place. So that was kind of a rambling um, answer, I'm sorry, but hopefully hopefully I got some ways of answering the question. Um, Isabel, did you want to jump in? Yes, I love a good ramble. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try not to ramble my question. So that kind of brings me neatly on to, I am quite excited at the prospect of you extending this out into a qualitative research part of, um, I'm assuming interviewing or talking to or having some sort of focus group with them. Um, people that have experienced this or have been stopped and searched and solicitors and other groups and I wondered is it quite there's a two part to this question is it quite easy to find those people and are there are there groups working on it to highlight it and bring advocacy to this problem and I suppose that's how you're finding you're nodding so yes <laughs> and then um and then my second part is how do um can people appeal uh, when they've been stopped and searched in this way? Or is there no appeal process for, for those who have been, I suppose, what we're saying, unjust, unjustly stopped and searched um, with the Section 60? That's my question. Is that right? Yeah, I know that's brilliant. So in terms of how do you find people um, who've been affected um, and uh, yeah, it is entirely possible, and I should say that um, there's not very much research been done on Section 60s, although, as I said, um, they are increasingly coming to people's attention, so that, that might change. Um, although the research can sometimes lag, it sometimes not only takes a little bit of time to catch a researcher's attention, but then also to get findings out, right? So, um, but I do expect that there'll be more about this in the coming years. 
But what I would say is that um, there are campaign groups um, and particularly police monitoring groups, I think keeping an eye on this very much. Um, Stopwatch, for example, will send out um, emails um, with reasonable frequency and at the end they always have a section 60 watch um, with always with the disclaimer that this is an incomplete listing um, but they're, they're keeping an eye on section 60s for sure and then if you were to go into a specific borough where there's an active police monitoring group I'm absolutely sure that they would have um, their finger on the pulse here um, but uh, I guess in terms of broader public consciousness um, there's more to be done particularly by researchers um, which is very much um, where I see uh, my role. Um, uh, yeah, but then in terms of speaking with people who have, have been affected, um, I came to research racialized policing. Um, first, I completed my PhD in Australia and I was writing about uh, Lebanese communities primarily being targeted by the police over a 20 year period, both before and after the advent of the war on terror. And I am Lebanese. Um, and in that, um, you know, is where I developed that sort of um, methodology of trying to seek out the views and experiences of people who have been policed. Um, but even, even as a Lebanese person researching police racism against Lebanese people, I found that you, it's not fair to assume that people want to speak with you for the purposes of research or that they want to share their experiences. So it's certainly not a given that those people who themselves have been policed using Section 60s will um, necessarily want to engage in an interview or a focus group, for example. But certainly um, I, I would like to um, gauge the possibility of that happening if, if that's something that people who are most affected and who bear the brunt of this um, see as being helpful. Uh, and in terms of talking to lawyers, that's something that I found useful um, in conducting my PhD research in the sense that Lawyers usually will have an entire um, list of clients who have been affected by um, similar types of police practice. And so they develop systemic views of how police do their work um, and can speak to how police practice looks on the ground without needing necessarily to speak to um, or about um, specific clients, for example. They can, they can tell you what trends in policing are and how police conduct their work because they see it um, you know, they see it being patterned, I suppose. Um, so that's the sort of thinking and talking to lawyers. And um, I think um, certainly there will be lawyers who have acted on behalf of people affected by Section 60 um, and other type of knife crime powers who would be willing to speak um, broadly about their clients' experiences. Um, you know, there, there are probably lots of good lawyers with good hearts who are very annoyed by this sort of thing. Um, and, you know, by racialized policing in London. So yes, I think it's entirely possible that I could speak with them. Um, and then the second question, sorry, I've lost. <laughs> I wrote the second, the first question down, but not the second. What was the second question? Sorry, Isabel. I may have forgotten it myself. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> that just tend to happen. I can't remember. But I do want to, I do think um, I wanted to say it. the solicitor's part is the most, it's a very interesting part because as you're saying they can speak quite broadly and in some sense put you in touch with um possible participants isn't it but it is interesting and to what it, what possible legal action is actually available to them for their clients right and how hampered they are and what they can actually do um but yeah i'll, I'll try and remember what the second question was <laughs> i've forgotten Sorry, I think I, I think I've remembered. Um, was it about um, uh, whether there's a um, opportunity to appeal? Uh, oh my God, did my internet go while I was saying that? <laughs> no, I think I've, I've um, got enough of that to recall the question myself. I think Naomi, thank okay. you. Um, and it riffed off something you said at the end there as well, Isabel. I think it was about precisely um, whether there's recourse for people to, to challenge Section 60 searches. Um, I mean, the, the, the thing that is most concerning about this power is that it, um, it is lawful for police to engage in highly intrusive action. So if you're in a Section 60 area uh, and you're a pedestrian or you're occupying a vehicle, um, whether that's a car or a boat, whatever it is, <laughs> um, 
you're li liable to be searched. Like that is lawful. Um, and so I guess that's the concerning thing. The powers themselves broadly have been to the European, um, oh God, what's the, I mean, I didn't study in uh, Europe, European Court of Human Rights, I think. Um, the powers themselves have been challenged um, in court and yet um, that was in advance of uh, the government um, making them more permissive and encouraging their use. So um, prospects for legal appeal, I would say, are fairly limited. Um, I should note as well that I'm not a lawyer, um, but certainly um, I, I wouldn't think that um, if you were someone who had been stopped by the police using Section 60 and that, that search, you know, you had occupied an area, a Section 60 area, I wouldn't think that legal challenge would be uh, the best recourse necessarily. But yeah, not not a layer. Um, so definitely take that with a grain of salt. Thank you, Megan. I actually had a couple more questions. Uh, the first one, <laughs> probably you might not be able to answer because not a lawyer, but um, I was curious about whether there's um, so. Uh, whether there's an obligation on the police's part to do something to inform people who are in a section 60 area about the fact that they're in that area prior to you know that happening because certainly I don't feel like that ever happens in Croydon like there's no you know you only find out afterwards um and my other question was you mentioned uh that you got some of your data by uh putting in a freedom of information request uh, and for context, I uh, work, I do journalism research. Um, so it's something that I'm quite interested in is what was your experience like doing that? Because obviously, I don't know about the police, but it FOIing like the Home Office or something is like impossible. <laughs> um, you know, they just find so many ways to sort of get out of giving you that information. Uh, so I'm interested in whether, you know, there was any kind of challenge to it or you know whether it took like 60 billion years <laughs> the short answer to that is yes but i'll come back to that, that second question um i can actually answer that the first question you asked about whether the police are required to notify people that they're in a section 60 area um and presently that is the case and that has been the case um, but um, the Home Secretary, in her wisdom, um, changed that last week. And so I don't think that the changes have yet taken effect, but it, the police will no longer be required to do that. And in any case, um, the ways that they did that were extremely patchy and I would say inadequate. So I tried to get some data about that as part of the FOI process. Um, so I asked for um, the number of uh, you know, where and when and how many um, Section 60s orders had been made, but also how the people had been notified each time that had happened. Um, and there's certainly no systematic data about that. But um, in refusing that part of the FOI request, the police told me that um, there was no standard operating procedure for how that would be done um, by police. So I have seen occasionally a tweet you know, like, you know, there's a section 60 across all of Hackney or something like that, um, which uh, is one way to notify people um, for sure. But um, if notification is supposed to have the effect of letting anybody know who enters that area that they are liable to be stopped and searched, I don't think that that's necessarily an adequate way to do it. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that answers that first part of that question. Um, and then secondly, in terms of freedom of information, I think it's potentially an excellent tool um, for police researchers and other people doing other types of investig uh, investigative work, but um, certainly a difficult tool to use. Um, and uh, so something that holds a lot of promise, but certainly promise might not be realised, I suppose, is what I'm saying. Um, I've used FOI fairly frequently in my research, first in Australia, and that was where that sparked the idea of how I might get the data here. Um, and I must say, actually, when I put in the first request, although certain parts of it, so for example, information about the notifications, um, was refused by the police because they didn't hold the data, um, 
they came back to me about that first six month period fairly quickly um, and with detailed information. Um, but then that sort of situation changed when I then applied for the second lot of data. Um, and it took a really long time, months and months and months to get the data. And what originally happened was that they sent me um, and this explains that actually why I've got that high level map is uh, when they sent through initial initially um, the period for the second half of my year of study, um, they just told me the boroughs. So they've gone from providing extremely detailed information to far less detailed information. Uh, and then I went back again and said, actually, you know, I'd like the street addresses, please. We're relevant. Um, and that took a really long time, but they did end up providing that information. Um, and is my intention to broaden this project out temporarily. So um, once I've finished mapping that, that first year of study to um, keep coming <laughs> towards the present day, if, as it were. Um, but I think it may be increasingly difficult to get that information, not least because um, I have been asking for it, <laughs> if that makes sense. I think that um, in some sense has um, uh, alerted the police that this is something um, that I am scrutinising. Um, and so, um, and certainly it's something that's been in the news, so on and so forth. And so it may prompt a little bit of um, risk aversion, I suppose. Thank you. Um, Sarah, did you want to ask a question? Thanks. Yes, thank you, Megan. I thought that was really, really um, interesting talk. I just wanted to ask whether you've, well, I don't know whether your data's covers this so if it has have you found any discrepancies between the actual areas that had the border and the actual exact places that people were searched within that so in other words are the areas sort of wider than the hotspots for searching or is there a sort of or is it just sort of dispersed within that particular section 60 area it was actually been really uh, thank you for that question Sarah it's a really good one um it's it's been very difficult actually to tie the searches to the orders if that makes sense so I asked police originally to tell me how many searches arose out of each order um who was searched um and specifically there I asked for using their terminology and ethnic breakdown of searches um per per order um and that was deemed refuse um as part of the freedom of information request because the records don't already exist as in the searches are not tied to the orders and police record keeping systems and in fact I believe they're kept in two separate systems so it would have been an unreasonable request um and these are these are sort of um terms that uh, quite common when you put in a freedom of information request it, it was deemed that it would be unreasonable in terms of the labor it would require of the police to tie those things together and so um i don't have a great deal of information about individual search events within um the uh you know as per each order if that makes sense um and so but what i have been able to do is get them to enumerate how many searches have been made and provide me with an ethnic breakdown, which is where I got that 52% figure. Um, what I would like to do, and again, I guess this goes back to actually the difficulty of doing this sort of research is it, it is extremely time intensive. When, when the police say that it would have been very difficult to tie the searches to the orders, that's true. I have no doubt about that. Um, but it is technically, I think it would be technically possible if, as long as they provided a date, uh, alongside each search being conducted because then you could figure out which order it, it you know, belonged to, I think. Um, that's something I would like to do, but I just think it would be hugely intensive in terms of labour and it's certainly not something that I could do unless um, I uh, wasn't um, teaching and involved in admin um, just because those things uh, obviously... Um, take up two thirds of my work time. And so if I were to do that sort of intensive research, I would have to be research intensive, like hundred percent, I think. <laughs> so yeah, uh, unfortunately that's kind of not the most um, helpful answer, but it is actually quite illuminating in terms of police record keeping systems um, and how, uh, you know, um, the difficulties of conducting research um, when you're trying to research uh, public authorities 
um, and navigate their bureaucracy and, and so on. I think that in itself um, tells us a lot about um, how police in this instance um, keep tight control over images um, of crime and crime control itself um, because if that information is not readily available, it's not able to be scrutinised, I suppose. Thank you. I think that's really interesting about their record keeping, about how they try and justify these searches, but don't actually link their search data to them. Yeah, well, it's, um, I certainly don't know that it was done on purpose. I don't want to make it sound conspiratorial, but it has been helpful in, in this sense, um, because it means that the, the, the data is less able to be scrutinised, I suppose. Um, thanks, Megan. I'm going to leave my camera off because it really doesn't want to really doesn't want to cooperate with me today. Um, so we've got about eight minutes left. Um, did uh, Steph, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, hi. Hi, Megan. Hi. How are you doing? Good, thank you. How are you? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Um, all right. I felt that since um, well, kind of my question, it's not a question, it's just like a uh, thing that I noticed and it's kind of off topic, not off topic, it's like an extension of topic, if I will. And since no one else has an uh, on topic question, I thought I'd say it. Um, yeah, because, you know, I kind of feel like in academia, we really focus on a certain matter and then, but I tend to look at things more like a whole thing. Uh, not that you don't, but, uh, and honestly, uh, always great to listen to you, man. Um, I'm kind of nervous because you guys are recording, so um, I'm going to be stuttering a little bit. Um, so I like what you're saying, the map specifically, it kind of um, made me, it triggered something that it's, I projected it worldwide and I thought specifically of Lebanon because that's, that's where I'm from, that's where I was uh, born and raised and I thought, I thought that um you know the red spots or the hot spots they're usually in lebanon in mostly uh shia dominated areas or sunni dominated areas it's best uh, shia dominated specifically and uh for hezbollah where hezbollah reside or hezbollah people reside or harakat amar people reside um and i thought of how um you know friends or just people i know who come to lebanon and want to do some work and i'm usually either guiding them or um, being their fixer or just um, working with them and then they tell me oh we can't go to these spots our insurance doesn't cover it and i'm like but this is where the like this is where the, your information this is where you can get the information you want and um and they're just technically and then i noticed i mean maybe not the first time or the second time but then from different ngos different academics different institutions and so I noticed and I kind of didn't like officially map it, but I mapped it in my head. It's always Shia dominated areas, Hezbollah dominated areas and the Sunni domin Sunna dominated areas of Lebanon. And Hamra was never, for example, Hamra Street was never a red spot or a hot spot until um, Iraqi and Syrian refugees um, uh, kind of moved into it. Um, but you will never find this a uh, hotspot in a Christian dominated area, for example. So, um, what was I saying? Um, so yeah, I'm just thinking that it's not an internal thing anymore. It's just, uh, I'm not, I'm not like, obviously I'm not saying that, oh, it's not just here, but what I'm saying is that I can't ha help but think that this is a kind of an internal a global internal and global thing at the same time so it's happening everywhere this stop and search random things and the hot spotting people because they're whatever they don't follow geopolitical um our geopolitical ideology whatever it is so um i forgot my question i forgot what i was saying <laughs> sorry i forgot what i was saying i i rambled and i forgot what i was saying but this um uh yeah, it's just, I think it triggered it triggered this in my mind and I'm thinking how uh, this is way beyond just um, 
just internal things, I guess, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I think that's a really helpful comment. Thank you, because it's always good to to break out of um, the Anglosphere. Um, with, although, of course, um, Lebanon has been deeply affected by the actions of um, Anglosphere powers, right? But I, what I would say is that um, th this is very much, I see this as being a case study of um, so, uh, you know, a detailed example of how this mapping approach might be used, um, in the words of a colleague from Goldsmiths, Theo Kandinas, to, to render subverf subversive interests, right? So, um, maps have, you know, facilitated colonization, they facilitated the theft and ex expropriation of land, right? Maps are inherently political and they're powerful, um, but, they can also be used to turn power on its head, I suppose, um, to use that phrase again. So when you undertake an exercise like I have in counter mapping, um, you render the world from your point of view, which is necessarily commensurate with um, what, you know, uh, that presented by those who um, have more power, I suppose. But I, it, precisely that, this is an approach that could be used in other contexts, and I hope it is. Um, I'm certainly not the only person undertaking mapping work. I didn't invent mapping. I certainly didn't invent counter mapping, uh, uh, counter -mapping or you know, um, critical um, cartography, but um, there's not a great deal, I don't know, of anyone else using this type of approach to study police practice um, in London or in Sydney, where I come from for that matter. But but certainly um, people are harnessing the power of maps in other contexts. And so um, if one effect of me potentially publishing this data is for people to find other ways to use this approach, and it's relatively inexpensive. I mean, you could use it, you could use Google Maps, for example, to do this, but um, the benefit of using a software like mine is that it's a little bit more sensitive, um, but even then cost about 600 US dollars for the license, which is a little bit of money, but certainly um, not completely out of people's reach, I wouldn't think. Um, so depending who they are, of course, but you know, if, if you were a local police monitoring group, you might be able to find $600 somewhere um, or find someone who um, had enough sympathy for your project that they might be able to give you 600 American dollars. And so, yeah, I think, um, yeah this this approach no it's Could great i mean it's great it. i mean um uh, sorry i interrupted it's, i'm just saying it's great that um like because it really clicked in my mind it's like oh oh shit this is really so i'm thinking um like do you i don't know do you like i'm thinking is it um is it like a i don't know is it like um i don't know what the words in english are sorry i'm, I'm forgetting my my whatever done <laughs> I'm just, yeah, I'm just, I, I can't find the words in English anymore. Well, feel free to flick me an email if it comes back to you. Just no... <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, I, I will if if I remember what I'm saying. Cool, no worries. <laughs> Sorry to waste your time, guys. No, it wasn't wasting. It was a very helpful comment, in fact. Um, and, and in fact, they were really helpful comments and questions. So very um, much appreciate uh, your time there, everyone. Thank you. And um, we have come to two o'clock, so um, thank you um, so much, Megan, for coming to talk to us. And again, as Megan said, thank you so much for uh, to everyone who asked questions. Um, uh, we are going to have uh, a few. Uh, we've got two more events uh, in this series coming up before the end of term. Uh, so if you check out the Student Union website or our social media, we will definitely uh, be posting about that on socials and all the details are on the website uh, to book to attend those. Uh, and they will all be online. Um, so hopefully more accessible than, <laughs> than the in-person events have been. Um, yeah, and again, thank you uh, so much, Megan, and everyone for, for coming. I'm going to stop the recording now.